in our alphabet, right? The mm -hmm. A, everyone assumes it's for ally. Yeah. But it's actually for asexuality. Yeah, is asexuality it, that, and aromanticism. A is part of one of the letters, is part of, it's right there in the lineup, and no one even knows what it means. And for those who do, they may think it isn't just never having sex, which right. is like the cultural assumption, the, the, the stereotype. Here to flip the narrative and take us to school, TikTok educator and author, Cody Daigle Orient, also known as Ace Dad. Culturally, we're sort of told you just got to go find the one who you're sexually attracted to, romantically attracted to, who is your everything and your only thing, and then you marry that person, have babies with them, and buy a house. Like that's the only, that's the ideal. Cody just wants to be seen. Make sure you let the identity language you use work for you. I think one of the hardest parts for me as an asexual person is just moving through a world that has never been designed to imagine I exist. He exists, he's married, and he's polyamorous. We're going to get into all of it. So many people think we're making it up or that we're a fiction or that asexuality isn't real. It's just something we're creating so that we feel special, that we hear that a lot. 1% of the population is asexual. It's not an act, it's real. Don't activate the theater kids. <laughs> yeah, we will. Or we wait, can we, we both Behind come out the... like. I'm Matthew Rodriguez, reminding you it's okay to ask questions. We're celebrating pioneers in the queer community in hopes of opening minds and hearts through thoughtful conversations. To better understand each other, let's talk and listen. Maybe then we'll realize we're a lot more alike than different. Cody, thanks for inviting us into your house like this. Yeah, welcome. I know this isn't the norm, people showing up with cameras <laughs> and being like, tell me about your life. Um, but I really appreciate it. And, and your story is very unique in that you didn't come out once, but you actually came out twice. So yes. tell me about the first time you came out. When I was a teenager, uh, I started like recognizing that I wasn't gonna like the other boys. I right. was interested in other boys. Mm -hmm. So like I, I knew straight wasn't what I was. And so around 18 or so, I'm really sort of considering and trying to figure out like what, what language works for me and what sort of describes my experience. And so when I was 18, I figured gay was what it was. That's mm -hmm. what was happening. So I came out, yeah, I came out as gay at 18. And how long did you live that life? For like the next 20 years or so, okay. or 20 plus years, kind of trying to sort of live in, in the gay community, live in that gay identity, um, not always feeling very successful at it. Like gay always felt like a bit of language that was a, a sort of an ill-fitting coat to some degree. Mm, like, interesting. I understood that gay described the relationships I was having and the people that I was interested in. But I never totally felt like other gay men. I never felt like I r related to gayness the same way or related to sex the same way that other gay men did. So I just sort of understood myself for most of my adult life as sort of a bad gay. That's how I always, uh, always described it. Like yeah. gay, but not so good at it. Gay, but maybe a little broken. I feel like there's a lot of gay people out there that have this looming thought that they are a bad gay. They're not gay enough. You know, they don't have this six pack. They don't have this mindset. They're not burly enough. They're not, you yeah. know, we have, because we've put so many constraints on that word. Yeah, it's a lot of pressure. And there's a lot of gay. boxes that people might not realize there's a lot of boxes within the That gay. you're trying to, right, to sort or, of fit like certain molds and fit certain standards right. that we have to, to, be, to be good at being gay. Yeah. Yeah. So you weren't feeling like that word encompassed who you were, then, you had a second coming out. What was that? Yeah, so um, in my early 40s, or 41, I was hanging out on Tumblr. Um, Good old Tumblr. Tumblr, like Boy, passing time I miss on Tumblr. Tumblr huh? <laughs> and uh, I w would encounter uh, posts written by asexual folks talking about not just like what asexual meant, but talking about how that looked in their lives, like how they lived asexuality and what it meant to them and what it felt like to be that. Mm -hmm. And in those posts from people, I started to recognize my experience, the things that I, were, I was assigning as being bad at being gay, I'm recognizing in these posts about asexuality. And that led me down the path of like investigating more and learning more. And then when I was 41, I came out as asexual. I, I realized that I had not been a bad gay for 20 plus years. Mm. I've just been a very good asexual person. When you say asexual, when I said, 
I'm driving to Columbus to interview a gentleman who calls themselves asexual. I had many people be like, oh, they, they just don't have sex. They don't have sex. That's what it means. That's the end definition period of that word. But it's so much more complicated than that. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the official definition of asexual is it's a sexual orientation that includes people who don't or rarely experience sexual attraction. Mm -hmm. So that can open up to a whole array of different relationships of experiencing sexual attraction. Some don't experience it at all. Uh, some asexual people do have sex as part of their lives. Uh, the majority of asexual people don't. But there is still a spectrum of those experiences. Uh, it isn't just never having sex, which right. is like the cultural assumption, the, the, the stereotype. At the end of the day, I, I think people assume then you don't enjoy sex. Is that the case? No. No. The general kind of understanding of attraction is like attraction gets used to describe a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. Attraction gets used to describe like the physical things that we feel, the things that are happening in our mind, who we're wanting to do a thing with. That all gets kind of lumped into attraction. But really, like that, that kind of human sexual response is a little, it's more teased out. So uh, when I teach it, arousal is a word that can describe the things that are happening like in your body, the body stuff, what your body's doing, what your body's feeling, what your brain is waking up to, uh, to like the notion of sex or whatever is happening. And is that the physical? That's the physical The stuff. arousal is the physical. Yeah, so like all that stuff you can kind of put in the, the right. arousal bucket. Because I think as a man I can identify, sometimes you're aroused, but you're like, I'm not really attracted to the person. It's just, a, it's a is thing that, your like, body's doing. I don't doing. know if people understand, yeah. but I can identify with that. Yeah, it's a thing your body's doing. Yeah. And there's also like the word libido that, that gets into this mix too. When I talk about libido, I, I use it to describe the intensity and frequency of that physical thing that's happening. So if you have it a lot and it's really intense, then you have a high libido. Uh, if it's the opposite, then you have a low libido. So libido describes kind of degrees, volume, if you will. Like it's the volume level of arousal. And we shouldn't say someone that's asexual has a low libido. Not necessarily true, right. An asexual person could have a high libido. Some do, some have low libido, some have none. Um, and then attraction describes direction and pattern. So where does that feeling go? Where does that physical stuff go? Who is it attached to? Who normally uh, like causes that to happen? Or when does that happen in relation to a person? And so like for, for someone who is gay, it, the pattern of, and direction is generally in the direction of someone whose gender matches yours. Mm -hmm. For me as an asexual person, I can have the arousal part, the libido can be there, that, those things can happen, but it's not directed anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. Uh, it's just a thing that's happening, but it doesn't get attached to any person, if that makes sense. And so you can have the physical stuff, you can do the mechanics of sex without there being that directional component to it. Like sometimes I drink a smoothie that just has vegetables in it because I know I need to do it. Is that fair to compare? Like, is that a fair comparison? Well, I feel like that sort of suggests that, like, that and it's like a it. chore. Yeah. And it, it's not necessarily so because, like, sexual attraction also isn't the only reason why people have sex with each other. You know, sex can be used as a way to express other kinds of connection and other kinds of attraction. Mm. You know, I don't experience sexual attraction, but I'm certainly romantically attracted to my part right because romance is a yeah like and so it can the, and and is romance too like the the time you spend together maybe some hand holding yeah cuddling that kind yeah of like definition. i have I, I i'm attracted to them that way i'm attracted to their brains i'm attracted to the people that they are yeah and if in the space of sort of expressing that and creating space for that for me sex exists in that space i can completely relate to that because before meeting my husband, I felt like all, <laughs> he might kill me, but <laughs> before meeting my husband, I felt like all my relationships and connections, it was all like sex-based, right? Mm -hmm. It was all just um, that lust, that attraction, getting drunk, hooking up, that kind of thing. Yeah. When I met my husband, granted, he is a very, you are a very good looking person, but it wasn't that. And people are like, shut up. No, it was, yes, it was. He's like, I'm like, no, it wasn't that. It was his brain. He was like so smart and thoughtful and heartfelt in a way 
that challenged me, wanted me to be better, wanted to grow as a person. Yeah. And I hadn't connected with anyone in that way before. Hmm. So that's where the connection was. Being able to sort of release that social pressure that we have to make sex a part of our lives and make sex a primary part of our lives um, is freeing for everybody. Mm. Uh, you're not limited to just what this sort of th what compulsory sexuality tells us the world should be. Mm -hmm. When you came out as asexual, how did your family take that? Were you with and were you in a relationship at that point? Yeah. Um, so I was married at the time. Oh. Uh, yeah. I've been. Okay. Yeah. So I, okay. So break that down <laughs> for us. Sure. Because, hey, hubby. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was married. My husband Neil and I have been married for almost ten years. Our ten year anniversary is in a few months. Happy and anniversary. Thank you. Um, and yeah, I, so I probably it was about four years in, I suppose, that that I kind of went through this journey and came out as ace, and. It was certainly challenging. Yeah. It was a challenging change because now I was in some ways like a different person in this relationship with him. But my my relationship with Neil, my marriage to Neil has been like a 10 year demonstration of like radical acceptance. Mm -hmm. like he is so loving and so open to any new version of myself that comes around and vice versa. We just give each other space to be who we are in whatever space. So although it was challenging to kind of renegotiate the, the rules and renegotiate the understandings and work through kind of hard feelings about what the past may have looked like and what the future may look like, uh, there was always, uh, we're going to be on a team together. We're okay. always going to be on a team together. And uh, that's, that's been pretty cool. That's wonderful. Yeah. When you told him, what was his initial reaction? Well, luckily, Neil is uh, is, is sort of as in, as into queer theory and queerness as I am. So he knew what I was like. Oh, he knew. Right. Oh, he, he knew what I was book. talking about. He was about. like, "Oh, I got We're it right good. here." <laughs> We're good. Yeah. Um, but mostly, it was just sort of a conversation and an ongoing conversation. It wasn't really just a one-off about like, "Well, what does this mean for our relationship? Mm -hmm. What does this mean for the practicalities of how we are to be together? Does that mean you want to stay in this relationship? Does it mean you want to go?" And it was sort of an ongoing exploration of what it was going to mean for us. So a, a negotiation of what the boundaries were, a negotiation of what felt comfortable and what maybe didn't feel comfortable. And this is where the education part comes in because I think automatically everyone is, that's watching right now is assuming that you just said, I'm not gonna have sex with my husband anymore. And that's not the case. No, um, so in the, the way that asexuals de describe themselves, there's language uh, that is used to kind of describe one's relationship to sex. Sex favorable is a bit of language that I use for myself. It means I'm an asexual person, but uh, I am okay, like I'm fine with having sex be part of my relationships if that's the thing that makes sense. And so that is true for the relationships that I'm in. And you've built a family of your own here, yeah. which I, I'd love for you to kind of explain your living situation now and the family that you've built up. Yeah, so um, I mentioned I was married. My husband Neil and I have been married for 10 years, but we're polyamorous, so we each have uh, other romantic partners. Uh, I have been in a relationship for three years with my partner Scott, and Neil has been in a romantic relationship for three years with his partner Dan, and the four of us together are a little polyamorous family. We call ourselves the Constellation. That's how we talk about our family. Uh, and we... That's a beautiful analogy. It's great. Yeah, well, Scott's an astrophysicist. Who's Saturn? Who's Mars? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and so we have this, like, beautiful little family unit where some of the relationships are romantic, yeah. some of them are not. Like, I'm not in a romantic relationship with Dan, but Dan is every bit my partner as Scott and Neil as we care about each other and we're there to support each other and see each other through life together. And I know everyone at home is like wanting me to ask, who has sex with who? That's none of your business. <laughs> okay? None your business. Thank you. That's the question we ain't asking today. All right? So let's just talk through the, the relationship, right? And yeah, like, sure. Who's who at the table? Um, so uh, Neil and I are married. We've been married for 10 years in September. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then I am also in a romantic relationship with Scott. Scott and I have been partners for three years. In May. Um, in three years in, in May. 
And uh, Dan and Neil have been romantic partners for three years as well. It's kind of around, two, roughly around the two same and time. Half. Two and, and a half. Like uh, and like those are the romantic relationships that consist of the family. But mm -hmm. we, we're all partners to each other in some way, uh, not necessarily romantically, because we are uh, we're a little polycule. Would you call us brothers in song? <laughs> <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> Maybe not. Okay. So uh, Neil, when Cody came and told you that they were asexual, what was your first thought? It tracked. It made sense. Um, I forever will have credit for that, though, because I was the one who was like, hey, have you heard of Tumblr? <laughs> okay. Um, and that's where you found asexuality. Well, yeah. asexual people yeah. posting. Mm -hmm. and, and do you identify as asexual? I do not identify as asexual. I have dated people that I suspect were asexual, mm -hmm. but I didn't have that language and neither did they until I met Cody. Dan, had you been in a polyamorous relationship before? No. Oh, no, tell your story. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I actually came out of the closet during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. I, I had been um, living with my family out in Utah, was born and raised Mormon, you know, did the whole two years missionary knocking on doors thing and all that. Really? Jazz and, yeah. Wow. And, um, you know, after I came back from that, I realized that church wasn't for me and I left that, but just because of a lot of the cultural hold that it has and um, I didn't feel comfortable even asking myself about who I was or mm -hmm. how I felt and then everything sort of came to a halt with the pandemic and that sort of led me to, to coming out and in that process I, you know, happened to have these wonderful people come into my life and so it was sort of a, um, what's the, the phrase, in for a penny, in for a pound? Or, do you know the... You got more than a pound. <laughs> <laughs> this is the point in the show where we pause the pizza party and talk terminology. I would love for you to break down some of the definitions because sure. there are so many different words. There's asexuality and then there's terms like demisexual mm -hmm. and aromantic and gray sexual. And I think they kind of get pushed all into the same category. Yeah. But they're all a little different. So um, asexual as a word has sort of double use. Asexual describes the entire spectrum of identities that exist in this space of not or rarely experiencing sexual attraction. So it's the big umbrella term. And uh, as a, a, an individual identity label, uh, asexual is used by folks who don't experience sexual attraction. It's the one that I use. It's the mm -hmm. one that makes sense for me. But there is that range of experience, there's a range of different kinds of relationships to attraction. So demisexuality is on the asexual spectrum and it describes someone who most of the time does not experience a sexual attraction at all um, until some bond is created with a person and then sexual attraction can exist. Gray sexual describes the sort of in-between place of mostly not experiencing sexual attraction, but sometimes Allosexual is a word to sort of describe everyone who regularly experiences sexual attraction. So heterosexual, gay, lesbian, bisexual, pansexual, those are all sexual orientations under the allosexual label. I'd like to get something straight here, no pun intended, <laughs> but <laughs> if you are, if you identify as heterosexual, can you also be ace, but still not be considered part of the LGBTQIA plus community. Yeah, there are people who are asexual, who identify as asexual, who are also living in what appear to be heterosexual relationships, heteroromantic relationships. Mm -hmm. They are um, men and women in relationship with each other. Those people exist, there are a ton of them. Some of them are parents, some of them have families. Like, yes, there are straight couples in the ace community. Does that make them queer? If they want to be, yes. They can, if they want to call themselves yeah. queer, absolutely. Fundamentally, do I think asexuality is a queer experience? Sure. Because it is, is an, it's an experience that exists outside of like the heteronormative expectations that everybody are, is placed under. But how you want to think about yourself is entirely up to you. If, uh, if you are in a heteroromantic relationship and are ace but don't really feel comfortable calling yourself queer totally cool. Like, th yeah, that's right. how you understand yourself and how you want to be 
uh, labeled. When it comes to identity words, I always say labels are tools, not tests. Yeah. They exist for us to describe our experience and find community with other people. So we use them as tools, as we need them. So if queer isn't a word that you need, don't use it. Yeah. If it is a word you need, you yes, absolutely use it. And I love that you said this. Like I want to slam the table. <laughs> I love that you said no one's going to come and check up on you and make sure each, each label makes sense. At the end of the day, the police are not showing up here and being like, oh, you have right. this attraction, you have that attraction, you don't fit in that category yeah. anymore, get out of here. It's about what makes you feel comfortable and how you feel um, that you want to express yourself. Cody actually wrote a book on asexuality, but even for him, <laughs> there's a lot left to learn. That's why we're going back to school for a little lesson on queer theory. We'll meet Cody's professor at the University of Cincinnati and learn more about the history of asexuality. Tristan, I have to try to do this as a sexuality. Are you all just giving up your books now? Hi, my name is Tristan Vaught. I'm a professor of queer theory at the University of Cincinnati. We all are on a spectrum of sex drive with asexuality being here and that being an umbrella with demisexual and many things underneath it. We all line up on that. And then when we look at our relationships, they're much more complicated than just sexuality. You can have romantic emotional attractions and attachments. Asexual individuals can be aromantic, sometimes they're not. And so they could be asexual in a relationship with a sexual partner. They could be homoromantic, panromantic, pyromantic, heteroromantic, any of those romantic emotional things. And I think that kind of disrupts the way in which we look at sexuality as a whole. It's been around forever, and Alfred Kenzie actually found it in 1945 when he was looking at heterosexuality and homosexuality in his seven-point scale. Um, in 1945, he didn't know what to do with that. About 1% of the population that he looked at wasn't having sex, didn't have the desire to have sex. So he threw it out of the study, calling them rated X, um, and saying that 1% of the population was rated X. Um, and in that, because he was a biologist, he was just looking at human behavior around sexuality. Um, it's been a recently that we've been able to connect to one another um, and make community around asexuality, but it's always existed. Micro labels often get a bad rap for being too confusing or too complicated when broader terms could be used. But it's important to remember why we have micro labels. They were created like all identity language to help us describe our experiences of the world. So when did you decide it was time to lean into this education of asexuality and helping people realize that it is much more nuanced mm -hmm. than we originally thought? It was entirely an accident. Really? Uh, yeah. What, uh, you, pandemic <laughs> on TikTok, right? Exactly. There we go. Like okay. entirely. <laughs> sums it up. It was totally an accident. <laughs> um, I, I I came out at forty one, but I didn't really start doing this work until about three years ago. Mm -hmm. So like forty four is when I started doing this work. And before that, I really didn't come out like publicly. I didn't I didn't share that I was ace with a lot of people. My intimate family knew, but other than that, not many people did. I didn't talk about it much. And uh, at the recommendation of my barber, I downloaded TikTok uh, just to sort of like goof around with and hang out on TikTok. And I made a video one day that uh, where I identified myself as an asexual person. Being ace can sometimes make you feel invisible. You don't see yourself in media. You feel left out of certain conversations. People don't see you as relationship material. Well, I see you. Our community sees you. And if we see you, you exist. You're valid. And we'll keep seeing each other until the world sees us. Uh, I was at work. I left my phone for a while, came back a few hours later to like hundreds of comments and thousands of new followers. Wow. Comments like, I've never seen an ace person that looks like you before. I've, I didn't know there were asexual adults. Uh, I've never... I didn't know that we had, I didn't know that we could have a future and wow. like that just like hit something really deep in me. When I first came out, it, it was gay elders and mentors that really helped me navigate my gayness and my mm -hmm. queerness. Right. And without them, I don't know that I would have maybe made it out of that experience. And so recognizing that the asexual community maybe didn't have that 
mentor elder person that I had a teacher skill set and I didn't mind, I had an actor background. Like I had some skills that could maybe fill that space. Mm -hmm. And so I started making educational videos, uh, the stuff that I was learning or the stuff that I had needed to learn. I would make videos about it. Here are five things, five things, five things I wish I'd been told about asexuality. Asexuality is a thing. So at 18, absolutely, it would have been super helpful for someone to say, hey, young Cody, um, asexuality, it's a thing, bro. Also encouraging things uh, to try to like give good dad vibes for people. Yeah, where does the dad <laughs> come from? Is it the image of a dad or, cause you're yeah, not a father. No, but, yeah. but like I'm, I've generally been the dad of every group I'm in. <laughs> I've had like, my nicknames have been like horror dad because like I'm, I'm a huge horror fan and I'm ge I've generally in like friends group, friend groups and things. I'm the one who kind of protects everybody. Okay. And it's kind of that nurturing dad. I have dad vibes just in general. Confession time. I call myself ace dad, but I'm not really a dad. What a faux pas. So um, that became my, my online presence yeah. and personality. How has that community helped you open up yourself as a human, connecting with people in this incredible way? Because technology <sighs> is fascinating in that way. I mean, I recognize that the ACE Dad Advice Project is very helpful to other people, but it has been incredibly helpful to me in better understanding myself better loving myself and feeling comfortable in the body that I inhabit. Um, it's connected me to an amazing community of people so that I don't feel alone mm -hmm. as an ace person. Uh, one thing that's really challenging about ace community is that most of it exists online. You know, like, it's hard to run into an ace. You're not it gonna run into really an ace person is. on the street. Yeah. Cause we were digging, our team was digging and you were the one that just kept popping up time and time again. And uh, that shows a lot of your effort. It shows the work that you put into it, but it also shows that people are responding to what you're putting out there. One of the most important things that drives all the work that I do and the work that I make is I'm always thinking of like 18 year old me. What did 18, what could 18 year old Cody have used? What did he need to not spend 20 years thinking he was broken? What kind of encouragement did he need? What kind of education did he need? What space did he need? And so that's what I try to make for other people so that no one else has to spend those 20 years that I did hating myself and not, not thinking I was uh, valuable or not thinking I was um, a full human being. I, w I don't want anyone else to feel that way. So I curate a space that hopefully helps others avoid that time. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. Why is it so important that we recognize asexuality as an identity? Because when you move through the world and see nothing that looks like you, you see nothing that sounds like your life, and you see no representation of the thing that you're living and experiencing, you assume that there's something wrong with you, mm -hmm. that you are broken, that you are deficient, that you are somehow flawed. It is important for us to sort of talk about asexuality and have it be seen in the world so that other people realize that they are not broken, that they are just this. They've, to, for people to see themselves allows them to be a full authentic version of themselves. And that should be what we want for everyone. Everyone should be allowed to live a full authentic life. And the more visible that we are as ace people, the more that we talk about it and the more that it's shown, it allows more people to sort of see that path for themselves if it's the right path for mm. them. Visibility matters. Absolutely. What does it mean to have all these great people here at this table right now? Yeah, Cody, what does yeah, it mean? Yeah, what does it mean? <laughs> um, like, no, I, I'm, I'm just like deeply grateful for it. I know that I couldn't be doing what I'm doing. I wouldn't be who I am in the world. I wouldn't be where I am without them. Um, yeah, like they're, they're, they're part of why this is possible. They're part of why, why I'm possible right now. And so that means a lot. That's wonderful. Thanks for opening up your home and your, and your heart for us to be able to come in here and have this conversation. This is wonderful. You got room for another? <laughs> 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 Whoa, hold up. <laughs>
<laughs> Maybe calm down. Maybe calm down. <laughs> <laughs>